Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Michael Sabia. I'm the director of uh, the Monk School at, uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, on behalf of all my colleagues at the school, we're uh, delighted, really delighted, uh, to welcome you this morning uh, to a conversation, I hope an informal conversation, uh, subject to what the technology permits us to do, with Canada's foreign minister, someone I've known uh, for some period of time, Francois-Philippe Champagne. Uh, before I go any further, though, uh, I do hope uh, that all of you and your families uh, are well and navigating through these, what can I say, unprecedented times um, as well as you can. Uh, so best wishes to, uh, to all of you, uh, and as I say, to your family as well. Uh, Francois Philippe, uh, I do want to thank you for, uh, for joining us. Um, in particular, though, I must say I want to thank you for the interest you've shown in meeting with uh, university students uh, at a number of universities in Canada. Um, and I think that openness and transparency on your part is something that needs to be recognized and acknowledged. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, I'm, uh, this morning, I'm going to dispense with the usual list uh, of a minister's accomplishments. Uh, I'm just going to say two or three things about uh, Francois Philippe before we, uh, before we get going. First, um, this is someone who is a uh, very skillful negotiator. And don't be taken in by the fact that he always smiles. Um, he <laughs> smiles a lot, but he's a very good negotiator. Um, He's very well prepared for this job. He spent many years of his professional life uh, in international business, then became Canada's trade minister. So he certainly has a background for this job. And then finally, uh, you're gonna be speaking this morning with someone who is, in my estimation, really a master, a master at building personal relationships around the world. Uh, and Canada needs those. And I think sometimes, in universities and in the academic study of foreign policy, sometimes we can underestimate uh, the real importance of person-to-person -person relationships, person-to-person -person communication, the human dimension um, mm. of, uh, of foreign policy. And let me tell you, Francois Philippe is a master uh, at, at that. So before we uh, begin the conversation, let me just say a word about process this morning. I'm going to lead off with, um, with a few questions uh, on some broad topics. And then I'm gonna turn to uh, questions uh, from uh, the people participating, students in particular, uh, who are participating uh, in uh, this webinar this morning. I have received already a great many um, of those, uh, but I, we're also gonna try to take some questions um, live uh, from, from you, so if you have them, you see on the screen um, the way to uh, to submit your your questions, and we will try to uh, incorporate some of those as well. Uh, so, uh, with all that as background, let's uh, let's get started, uh, Minister. In the uh, in the wake of the outbreak of the COVID uh, crisis, uh, you've led. I guess what could be described as the largest repatriation of Canadians in peacetime in our country's history. You've been texting foreign ministers, you've been negotiating airfares with airlines. You yourself described, uh, you described yourself as Canada's travel agent uh, a few weeks ago. Um, you've really been at the face of the coal mine um, here as we've, the world has tried to navigate its, through, its, its way through this very, very challenging period. So my first question is, what's that been like? Uh, what's the hardest thing that uh, you've had to try to do? Um, have you worked with other countries? What lessons have you learned uh, about diplomacy in a crisis? Well, first of all, Michael, let me just say a good morning to everyone. What a nice way to start the week. And I must say, I'm relieved to be on the same side than you, Michael, because if I'm a skillful negotiator, now that we're on the same side, it's, it's reassuring to all of us and, and to all the students watching, uh, if you wanna have a class on negotiation, Michael Sabia um, is probably uh, the best of the best that you can imagine. So it's great to see that someone like you, Michael, would give back and, and, uh, and be with students and share the wealth of experience you have in, in your career. And Thank you. we've been on the international scene together 
uh, I, I always felt a, a great sense of togetherness when we are there and promoting Canada as Team Canada, whether you were in business or now in academia and us in government. So it's a real honor to be with the Monk School. Uh, I've been wanting to be with you, all the students, for quite some time. We just didn't manage before COVID, but actually it allows us to have probably more people. We have 333 people now um, on our video. So it's, it's a good thing to be together and thank you for giving me the opportunity. You said it, Michael. I think it's, um, you know, as the world went in pause, we went in fast forward. Um, we were confronted with the largest repatriation effort in Canada's history in peacetime, you're quite right. Um, and, and it's not only in the scope and its complexities. I mean, uh, to see the end at the end of the tunnel, you have to remember that when this started, uh, we had a first repatriation effort in Wuhan, which was complex, we thought at the time, because uh, we, we had a group of Canadians who were now in quarantine and we needed to find ways to support them as the government should do and repatriate those who were asymptomatic. And then it moved to the Diamond Princess, you will remember in Japan, which we thought again was complex. We had 50 Canadian citizens in about 27 hospitals in Japan. And uh, now we started to appreciate the level of complexity. And then it became a pandemic. And now the complexity was at its climax where you had airspace closure, airport closure, border closures. Uh, you even had martial law uh, in a number of countries. Uh, Peru is an example. So uh, it became utterly complex as to how you repatriate. Uh, it's never been done. I can assure you, I spoke with colleagues around the world, uh, the sheer volumes, you know, we have about 3 million Canadians abroad. We had 400,000 Canadians registered on our uh, uh, registry of Canadians abroad. And now we started to work with airlines to repatriate those who went in spring break. So making sure that as hair travel was diminishing to its most simple expression in, in, in our nation history, I think. We needed at the same time uh, to think to how we can repatriate these people from all these countries. And I'm proud to say that today uh, in commercially facilitated flights, we have repatriated more than 20,000 people from uh, 75 countries and more than 175 flights. Uh, when we started the, the the operation, we had about five to 6,000 people on 115 ships around the world. And over the weekend, I'm pleased to say that uh, we no longer have Canadians on uh, Canadian passengers on commercial ships. We still have a bit of crew. So it has proven to be um, quite unique and, and you're quite right. Uh, that's the time where I, um, you said in a diplomacy, we think about state interest, but I would really say to the students, uh, um, people matter. Uh, it, it really made a difference that uh, uh, I was lucky enough to get the uh, the phone number uh, because I was foreign minister for at least four months and I was trade minister before. I had the cell phone of probably, if I look at the G20, probably all my colleagues and, and way beyond. So it really allowed to facilitate. I uh, did the text diplomacy. Uh, I'm not sure it existed before, but I can assure you if we have Canadians who could come back from Peru, um, I started to text my counterpart and, um, and the same thing in Morocco where uh, the airspace was closed. This is how we got in contact. So it, it's been extraordinary. And I want to thank our civil uh, service, uh, our missions abroad. Uh, to be honest, the, the whole uh, global affairs uh, department has become a consular office. Um, to give you a sense of perspective, in the, at the peak time, in the two weeks where we had the peak time, we had 58,000 emails uh, during two weeks. Uh, uh, when it started, we were fielding about 10,000 calls, 14,000 emails a day. And I would get with my team about 600 messages. So I must tell you that uh, there were some nights and some morning that you say, how are we gonna do it? But uh, thanks to dedicated professional, uh, thanks to creativity, entrepreneurship that, that people, um, you cannot have control and command structure in these cases, you have to delegate, you have to trust people, you have to accept that mistakes are gonna be made, but overall you get it right. Great, let me, uh, let me move on, uh, recognizing um, time and the number of questions um, that are on the table. Let me ask you something else, change the subject. Um, well, it's related, I guess, to, to what we were just talking about. Um, so my question, my, other questions about multilateralism. Um, and, you know, that's been, I guess I would say, what, the core principle 
of Canadian foreign policy for a long, long time, for, for several decades. But and I'm not sure you're going to agree with what I'm about to say, but, you know, in my opinion, um, in the current crisis, the G7 and the G20, two very important um, uh, multilateral fora, um, they really delivered, at least in my judgment, very little. Um, and that, I think, is very different than the, cri the financial crisis of 08 and 09, where they delivered quite a lot, and they played a very important role um, in getting through that crisis and in the recovery, the slow recovery, but the recovery not nonetheless that followed from that. And, you know, the fact that this time the G7 and the G20, at least in my opinion, haven't delivered that much, is kind of ironic because in a pandemic, you know, that's a situation where it seems by its nature to call for effective multilateralism. So my question is, what's happened here? Um, it's true, and maybe it's just been bad luck that the Americans were chairing the G7 right now, and that they're not all that interested in multilateralism, and the Saudis have been chairing the G20, and similarly, they're not that interested. So maybe it's just been bad luck uh, as to where the, who's been chairing the, these two important groups. Or in your estimation, is there something deeper going on here that explains why these two very important um, forms of collaboration really haven't delivered? Well, uh, Michael, it's clearly not 2008, um, but I would say I would pause um, uh, with respect to your assessment in a sense that um, we have seen uh, some initiatives on the multilateral base that may not that have been obvious to everyone. But if you look at our domestic response, our domestic response has been largely informed by multilateralism. I mean, if you look on the health side, we work with the World Health Organization. If you look on the financial side, the G7 finance ministry, the G20, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, if you look at the, the data side, the, how we're going to start the recovery, we work with the OECD. So I would say that uh, on, on one end, um, you had some initiatives on the health minister, on the finance minister, and, and you know, multilateralism is part of our DNA as Canadians. So what we did, and it was a time for Canada to show leadership. I'll give you a very example, a behind the scene for the students. Um, when we saw what you saw and, and thought that more could be done, um, I started to go to my Rolodex. Well, I guess today it's called a contact list on iPhone. It used to be called a Rolodex. And, and I started to phone a number of colleagues uh, really informally to say, should we get together? Should we, you know, would you be interested that we get together to share best practices, lessons learned, actions? Uh, we were repatriating people from around the world and our challenges seem to be similar to others. So uh, we created the uh, foreign minister's uh, COVID response group kind of out of a personal initiative, you know, and this included about 15 countries. Imagine Canada was able to convene countries like Brazil, Turkey, uh, South Korea, Singapore, South Africa, uh, France, Germany, uh, the UK, Mexico, uh, Peru, Morocco, Indonesia, countries that you would not necessarily see talking, but we're talking every week now uh, to try to see how can we do as foreign ministers. And out of that initiative, uh, we started to talk about the air bridges, like we had during the Second World War. Mm. Because I understood even early on that connectivity would become problematic as, as airlines were stopping to operate across the world. Uh, we started to talk about transit hubs, saying that if, uh, if you don't allow domestic transit or international transit in your airport, people are going to be stranded all over the planet we started to talk about supply chain and saying we need to remain them intact. Otherwise, we're gonna be facing a number of challenges when it comes to domestic production of essential uh, medical gear. So I think you saw the old alliances trying to do what they can, but you saw some new alliances mm. being formed. And I think this is gonna be really um, informative as we're looking beyond uh, the post-COVID crisis. I think you'll see uh, these new alliances, who was open, who could be trusted, who was reliable during this crisis. And um, so I would say on one end, domestic response informed by multilateral organization, but also some new form of alliances that came out of uh, uh, initiatives. Look at the Alliance for Multilateralism with Germany and France, uh, where we 
we did that. Look at our own initiative, uh, the Canadian Initiative of Foreign Minister. We had a declaration which was subscribed by a, a number of countries, I think 14 countries already, and we have discussion with India, with South Africa, um, Turkey. Think about that, Canada being at the middle every week where we're talking about that, trying to think how can we do better, uh, trying to think about the post-recovery, uh, the sciences, and uh, because, you know, the pandemic, the pandemia came in Canada a bit later than other countries, we are in a position now to learn from others, South Africa, from Singapore, and, and, and learn what they did. And that's kind of a way where we've been able to lean in a very different world than the one that we had in 2008. Now, that's interesting. Um, that's interesting, the prospect of different patterns of alliances coming out of this based on who was able to work together uh, during this. So that's an important, that's an interesting and important point. Let me just extend that a little bit. Um, not, again, a broad question. Um, you know, Francois Philippe, in my mind, we've been, the world's been in a, I guess I'd say a slow retreat from globalization over the last four or five years. And that's had, that has a number of, of, of origins. Part of it is um, this sense that uh, the benefits of globalization have been unequally shared and that's given rise to populism, which in turn has given rise to some trade protectionism and some trade wars. Uh, that's been one thing. But second, and maybe even more fundamentally, you know, we are now seeing the United States and China uh, engaged in what will probably be a pretty long-term rivalry. Um, so in a way, you know, our world's becoming more bipolar, it's becoming more regional, um, and maybe there's a certain amount of inward looking, um, an orientation to look inward among, uh, within a number of, of, of countries. So my question, or a couple of questions is, for a, a small country, an influential country, but a small country like Canada, um, as that as the world changes in this in these ways, um, what do you think that means, and how does that influence your thinking about the future of foreign policy, in general, but more specifically in this world of the United States and China and this bipolar rivalry, how does a country like Canada, how do we navigate through these two poles? Well, let me start with the United States. You know, uh, uh, the fact that we're friends, neighbor, and allies, uh, the fact that we still have two billions of trade uh, going on every single day uh, makes us, um, I would say, allies forever because, in a way, uh, we are uh, bounded by geography, we are bounded by our economy, we are bounded by people to people. But that being said, Michael, sometimes we have to remind our friends down south that we are up north, you know, that, that we are integrated and you may have seen at some stage where I had to uh, talk to my counterpart in the United States and just remind him a couple of things when we had these things about supply chain, yeah. how yeah. fundamental it was because our supply chains have been integrated for a number of decades now. I mean, you came from an industry which you know that well, uh, investments have been going cross border, parts are moving. So I had to, uh, and, and we have to do that from time to time as Canadians, remind our friends down South uh, that, that it's in our mutual interest to maintain these supply chain intact, to maintain a common approach like we did on the border, that we need to take measures to protect North America. Um, on the medical supply, I remember a call where I had to say, just remember that in 2019, I think, Canada exported a number of billions of dollars in terms of medical equipment to the United States, reminding our colleagues that um, you have a couple of thousand people who are leaving uh, Windsor every day to go work in Detroit in, in the medical field, uh, that you have a couple of hundreds of people who are doing the same in Quebec towards the state of New York. So maintaining the supply chain, I was saying, you know, what's being built by GM in Detroit is, is with parts that are coming from companies like Linamar in Windsor. Yeah, yeah. So trying to bring that in, in the context and saying we, we are uh, bounded in how we need to uh, deal with this situation and the best way to do that obviously we're both sovereign but where we need where we can cooperate where we need to cooperate for example on supply chain we need to do that uh, when it comes to China I mean China is the second largest economy uh, three things come to mind 
uh, when, it, when it came uh, with China, I would say um, every time I've had uh, the uh, opportunity to talk to my counterpart, uh, particularly during uh, the crisis, I talk about open communication. I mean, you said it, Michael, uh, this is a crisis like the world has never seen in 75 years, which is truly global. Uh, whether you're in Shawin again, where I am, or in Shanghai, uh, whether you're a health worker in uh, Vancouver, or uh, you're the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, um, everyone is, is exposed to the same way, and it does not discriminate. It's invisible, it knows no border. So open communication about, about uh, what happened in China was important as the world was trying to find their own responses domestic. Uh, the second thing when I talked to, to my counterpart was to assure uh, supplies, both in terms of quantities and qualities, because we could see early on that there will be a bottleneck. It'd be a bottleneck in terms of volumes because uh, a lot of the PPE and a lot of the ventilators and other uh, crucial medical devices are manufactured in China. So from day one with Ambassador Barton, our ambassador in China, we created like a, a crisis team um, in Beijing and Shanghai to make sure that we could vet some of the uh, original equipment manufacturer, that we could follow the logistics and make sure that uh, the trucks could, you know, the, the goods on the trucks could eventually be loaded on planes. The third thing, uh, I would say, you have to remain true to your values and principles. Uh, it allowed me to speak about the case of Michael Kovrig and Michael mm -hmm. Stafford and, mm -hmm. and Mr. Schellenberg. And, um, you know, we marked the 500 days where they have been in arbitrary detention uh, very recently. Uh, this is 500 days too many. So uh, it allows us at the same time uh, to um, ask for open communication, uh, see that supplies would be uh, coming our way as they should. And, and thirdly, I would say to speak up for our principles and our values. So let me, um, I'm going to switch gears now and um, raise some issues that uh, some of many of the students who have, uh, who are listening to this, uh, this morning have sent in. And I must say, uh, Francois Philippe, it's a credit to you. We have had a, an enormous number of questions. I would give so, credit to you, Michael. I no, 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 to you. Here. So, um, and I'm not going to be able to vaguely do justice to the number of questions that that have been that have been sent in. But just on the point you just made um, about China, uh, we do have a, a, a few students raised um, the issue that I'm going to touch on, which just goes which goes a little further um, on some of the things that you just touched on in your answer to my previous question. Um, so a question from Arlene Wong and Crete Atkinson. Um, you know, and I think they're right about this, that China, uh, a lot of observers have said that the environment in China right now with respect to uh, personal protective equipment, it's a bit like the Wild West. Um, and that he or she who pays the most gets what they need. Now, a couple of weeks, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, um, there were two Air Canada flights from China, um, flights that left empty. So, and I know, you know, the official, there were official comments with respect to there were logistics issues around the Shanghai airport, et cetera. You and I have both been there. Shanghai airport's a pretty sophisticated airport. They know how to manage logistics. Um, so their question, Arlene's question and Creed's question is, what happened there uh, that those, planes would leave empty, and what does it tell us about the relationship between Canada and China? Well, I'm happy you asked the question because I'll, I'll insert to you on the basis of all the information I've been able to gather from our mission uh, when this incident happened. It's, it's really a, a Michael logistical. I mean, on that particular day, um, you have to think that Shanghai, uh, Shandong, the, the, this is the third largest logistical hub in the world. And on that particular day, I'm told, and my numbers could be wrong by a few, but I think it's like they had 374 flights leaving that day. This is the highest number of flights they ever had in the history since the airport exists. Um, so um, 
I think that when we went back and did, you know, a postmortem of that, we realized that there was real logistical issues on that day. And what we did with that uh, was to engage with the Chinese authority uh, because uh, that day we were not the only nation, by the way, we left empty. And the whole reason why planes have left empty, so people understand, is that uh, the way you work is that you stage in a nearby country, you fly in with your crew, but because of the crew rest regulation, they can only stay on the ground so many hours before they have to take off to come back to Canada. Otherwise, you would exceed the crew rest period that the crew can be in the air. So it was not about domestic regulation, but it's just like, um, I would say, air safety regulation where crews have a number of hours where they can be flying, just like on any commercial flights. So what we've been doing since then is a couple of things. First, we have the crisis uh, group that we created with uh, Ambassador Barton to work with Minister Anan, to work with um, Public Health Canada to make sure that uh, we, we can better coordinate because you have to appreciate that not only the federal government is trying to procure, uh, provincial governments are trying to procure, territorial governments, we even have community hospitals which are trying to procure. So we've been trying to, to play a role of coordination, try to make sure, like you said, that never again uh, planes would leave empty and that we could try to streamline the process. That's step one. The second step we've been doing, and, and you will remember, Michael, I've always been, when I was trade minister, I was talking about the imperative of diversification. Yeah. So the same weekend that we had an issue with respect to some uh, medical equipment, I got on the phone with a number of colleagues to try to talk to CEOs in Switzerland, in Italy, in Germany, to try to find different source of supply. Because understanding that uh, uh, anyone who see the situation as is, would want to diversify uh, their source of supply to make sure that we are not dependent uh, uh, solely on one particular country for the volume that we need in terms of protective equipment. The third thing has been to work with domestic uh, companies to have domestic production, to ramp up that domestic production that uh, uh, we would be um, hopefully uh, self-reliant at some stage uh, with respect to key crucial medical supplies so it's been a three-pronged approach, but on, the, on that particular incident, all the facts that I've been um, analyzing and the reports that I got was really on the day where uh, not only Canada, obviously, as you might appreciate, is procuring, but the world is procuring at the same time. And this has, even for China, even for China, Michael, has, provide, uh, has, has shown to be a real, real challenge because you're talking about uh, hundreds of millions uh, of, of equipment that is going through that. It's, it's one of the efficient points, but that particular day, uh, my understanding, there was a choke point, and now we're trying to see how we can uh, alleviate that and diversify, look at pro domestic production, and work with our mission in Beijing and Shanghai. Just before I move on to a different subject, just let me ask you, given um, you know, the sad case of the two Michaels, the, the Huawei situation, um, just quickly, how would you characterize today the quality of the relationship between, between Canada and this very important emer asc ascending power? Let me describe China in those terms. How would you describe the quality of that relationship today? And before I, I stop on this, I do want to commend the government. I think appointing Dominic Barton uh, as our ambassador to China was one of the best appointments that that your government's uh, made for I mean, Dominic has a long, long history there and can play a very constructive role. But in any event, to come back to my question, how would you characterize the quality of that relationship? Well, I believe in engagement. Uh, when countries have differences, uh, you need to engage if you want to see things changing. It's not only true in diplomacy, it's true in life in general. It's true in business, it's true in personal lives. So I would say if you look at our civil service, they would tell uh, me recently that I probably talk to my counterpart in China more often than uh, probably many, many other foreign ministers in the history of Canada. Uh, I've been talking to my counterpart probably every other month, which considering uh, where we are in our relationship, uh, I believe in engagement. And considering that every time I speak up uh, for our values and principle, I speak up for the Michaels, I speak up for uh, open communication and transparency, um, I've said from the beginning that we will need to establish a new framework with China. 
which is based on rules and trails and principles. And part of our principle is to speak up for human rights. And despite the fact that every time that we talk, I raise human rights issue, I raise issues about uh, information and communication, I raise the, the case of Michael Kovring and Michael Spavrig and Mr. Schellenberg, uh, they still engage with me. And, and, and I would say in diplomatic terms, um, I, I would say, you know, in the last calls we had, by the time we request a call and the time we organize it, in most cases, it's been something close to 24 hours, which anyone who's been a previous ambassador would tell you that it is not necessarily um, that customary in the history of our relationship. So despite our differences, um, we are uh, able to talk, and I think every time to talk, it allows me to put uh, Canada's position interests forward. And there are areas where we will have strong disagreement with China on many things. But there are also areas, you said it, Michael, where as the second largest economy, uh, if, if we want to drive change, for example, on climate change, if we want to drive change on other key topics of global interest, I think uh, being able to talk to each other um, with uh, our respective difference. Every time we talk, I feel that we are advancing our relationship a step. Let me uh, change the geography now. Um, a number of the questions uh, that we've received have uh, been around an important part of the, of the pandemic crisis, and that's the impact that the pandemic is either very likely to have or almost inevitably will have um, on the global south. Um, I think we're certainly seeing the beginnings of a very problematic situation in Africa, um, elsewhere uh, in Southern Asia, uh, potentially in Latin America, certainly a situation in Brazil is, is, is one to worry about. Um, so as I say, a lot of um, folks participating in the webinar this morning have, have raised this, this, this issue. Graham Scott Wilson, Anthony Scott, other people, lots of people have raised issues around, around this. So questions. Um, how far is the government of Canada willing to go? Uh, because an issue that's been raised is with respect to not just the suspension of payments of debt, suspension in a period of time, but rather to outright debt forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and is that something that's on your government's agenda and something that the government's prepared to advocate in multilateral circles? Yeah, and, and couple of things on that, uh, Michael. I think it's a very important question. We have been very concerned since day one, and even in my small foreign minister group, which is about uh, 15 countries, we've been talking about the most vulnerable and making sure that uh, uh, we, we pay attention to that because you're quite right. I think we'll see uh, the peak of the pandemic in some of these regions probably around May and June. Uh, I don't think we've seen much yet uh, because probably testing is starting and data is being collected. But Canada has been very at the forefront. You talk about Africa, Southeast Asia, you can talk about Pacific Islands. And one of the things we've been doing, Michael, and I'm pretty proud uh, of Canada, is to amplify their voice. Uh, because a number of these countries obviously don't sit necessarily at the G7, the G20, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Commonwealth, La Francophonie, NATO, a number of these organizations. So one thing we did recently, I had the privilege with our ambassador, Ambassador Blanchard in the United Nations, to co-chair with Jamaica uh, on the SDG uh, and, and uh, with the UN. And this was my first, by the way, that's why I'm better with Zoom now, because I had to co-chair a meeting with 314 countries or representatives, I should say, because you could not really see who was on the line. But I, I was pretty astonished that the UN could be, um, that we could have such a fruitful discussion on the sustainable development goals um, where we could talk about um, the issues. And let me give you examples because I think students would be interested by the yeah. behind the scenes. Um, we had, for example, Fiji was talking, can you imagine the impact? This is a health crisis, which we don't want to turn into humanitarian crisis, uh, nor a food crisis. But if you're an island state, let's say in the Caribbean, bring it very close to, to where we are. Um, many of these economies are probably uh, mono-industrial. They rely by and large on tourism. Uh, with what's going on now, and as you know, you know, tourism has dried up probably everywhere in the world. Uh, they're having a double impact. 
one, they have a health crisis, a humanitarian crisis, uh, potentially a food crisis, because not only they don't have tourism, but they don't have the hard currency which is coming. So if you're an island state now, you don't even have the US dollar to say it, uh, to buy the critical uh, and medical equipment that you need. And secondly, uh, you don't have the hard currency to buy the energy to move goods yeah. around or foods around. So uh, from the very beginning, uh, we, we said that we need to speak up for them. And I'm proud because that's, that's the way that Canada can play a positive leadership in the world. That's why we're so relevant at the UN, uh, in our UN Security Council pursuit, uh, because people are looking for trusted, uh, reliable, uh, predictable partner, and Canada's prov uh, proven to be one. And I'm very hopeful for the future because I see Canada as being, you know, Canada is the only country in the G7 to have a free trade agreement with all other G7 countries. You've heard me say that time and time again. But I think in the post-COVID world, where a lot of focus is going to be put on reliable, predictable supply chain, I think Canada could play a real, uh, a real key role in the world when it comes to food diplomacy, health diplomacy, because there's a number of countries who've said, uh, you know what, we had relationship with other country, but as the post-COVID world is going to come, we're going to reassess our relationship. Uh, some countries had supply chains which were in, you know, in place before but I've proven not to be the right ones for the crisis. And I think you will see, mm -hmm. we even had countries, Michael, who said, don't send us money, uh, sell us food. And when you hear things like that, I think it is very, very uh, significant how Canada can position itself um, in the world, uh, where people are gonna be looking for uh, people who are probably uh, open, more predictable and trustworthy uh, when a crisis come and, and speaking up for them. I've been, and Minister Gould from International Development has been speaking up. We've been speaking up for those who probably have a voice, but sadly enough in our world, that voice probably does not resonate in all the international organizations. Let me press you a little bit on this issue about um, the Global South and, and countries that are gonna struggle uh, with, yes, the health uh, effects of this, but also the economic and social effects, and in particular, um, you know, the Prime Minister um, for years now has placed a considerable emphasis and has said that Canada has um, a feminist foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you look at the probable impacts of the virus crisis in a con on a continent like Africa, it's women and girls who will tragically suffer the most um, in terms of the likely social and economic consequences of this crisis. Given the emphasis that, you know, your government's placed on, on that issue of the feminist foreign policy, what would the government, what is the government thinking about and prepared to do to try to reach in and assist women and girls who are substantially affected by this? Well, one of the first thing is that we started to talk about, um, there's two things when it comes to women and girls, and I'm happy that you asked that question, Michael, because it's very important. It's very fundamental uh, to the difference we're making in the world. Uh, there was the physical security. You know, we were probably one of the first or among the countries who talk about domestic violence. At the same time that you ask people to be confined, uh, many people can find a safe place uh, to be confined. And, and you can think of many examples. You don't need to look necessarily too far sometimes to think about that. And that's why even domestically, we put a uh, significant amount of money to make sure that we, we recognize the problem, we speak about the problem, and we speak about solution, empowering a lot of women organizations uh, around our country. Because we know that there's a number of houses uh, which might not be a safe space uh, for young women and, and, and girls and, and uh, so we were concerned from day one about that. The other thing was about economic security uh, because we know and you would know coming uh, uh, from the private sector that there's a number of barriers to get credit. So we were very mindful that women entrepreneurs who may mm -hmm. want to get credit, it, it's even difficult before, let alone how difficult it could be after when, when people are, um, are reassessing risk and, and are probably not making loans as available as they used to be around the world. 
So we have these two things in mind. One is about uh, physical security. These are, the other one is about economic security. And this was the lens that we applied with Minister Gould when we were trying to look at where are we going to spend our dollars? Uh, where are we going to invest in the future? And making sure it would have an impact because uh, this should be on the front mind of everyone. I mean, there are many places in the world where even before the pandemic, it was utterly difficult. We knew that yeah. uh, it, it was uh, the security, the safety, the stability in many places was challenged. Uh, and now with the pandemic, it, 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 it will be even worse. So uh, I am proud to say that this is the lens in which we have been applying our international aid, that we will continue and also speak up so that the world uh, understands that. And I can tell you when we had this uh, uh, magic, I would say, video conference with 300 plus participants at the UN, uh, the issue of domestic violence, the issue of physical uh, security uh, for women and girls was raised uh, and, and Canada participated and we will continue to speak up for that. Um, another question. Um from uh, a, a number of students uh, raised this, Andrew Yin, um, Justin Gander, number of others. Uh, and that's a question about the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we all recently saw, and at least if you permit me to editorialize, were, I would have greatly disappointed, let me put it that way, by the announcement of the American administration to, um, essentially cut its funding to the World Health Organization um, at a time when arguably uh, the World Health Organization has probably never been as important as it is today. And, you know, I hate to sound like the Grim Reaper, but it's not impossible that the world's going to find itself facing similar uh, health emergencies in the future. Um, People like Bill Gates have been talking about pandemics for some period of time. Now I think we're, we're all living the reality that, that he was right um, and that this is a, a significant global risk. So the World Health Organization gets more important, not less important um, going forward. And yet, you know, the wealthiest, most powerful country in the world, um, at least for now, is distancing itself from the World Health Organization and hence really hobbling its, its capacity to, to do the kind of work that it really needs to do. So what would, what's Canada's position on this and what would Canada be ready to do working potentially with other countries to reinforce the World Health Organization? Well, like you said, uh, Michael, uh, the World Health Organization is playing a crucial role. I often said it's not when you have a fire raging that you start asking yourself, did you have the right uh, smoke detector? And now we have a health emergency that we need to make sure it doesn't turn into humanitarian uh, crisis uh, and, and in a food crisis. And like you said, the WHO is playing a crucial role uh, in Africa, in, in, in Southeast Asia, in, in Latin America. So we do need, I mean, this is the best that we have so far. Um, you know, I paraphrase Churchill, this is what we have. So let's nurture what we have. And, Yes, there'll be a time to do a post-mortem, to ask the tough questions, to say, uh, to look at the, the leadership, to look at transparency, to look at the mission, uh, to look that we have the right alert system. But at a time where so many countries, uh, Michael, are relying on the science, on the data provided by the World Health Organization, because today, this is the institution we have. And we are probably only in phase one of the crisis. So, I've always said, you know, there's a time for everything. And I think the prime minister has said it. Uh, today, we have an emergency. So let's deal with what we have. Let's not undermine uh, an institution which is providing, like you said, for hundreds of million, uh, uh, what I would say, an essential service uh, when you are facing a crisis. And let's wait for the postmortem uh, to be done later. Uh, this is a time for people to be transparent, uh, to be accountable. Uh, but, you know, today we have an emergency in front of us. And I think that uh, if you look in Canada uh, and many countries, we have been uh, uh, informed in our domestic response by what is being published by the World Health Organization. So um, I'm certainly a, a, a believer that now this is what we have. Um, certainly there'll be a time where we can ask, how can we improve the, the organization? How can we make it uh, make the organization fit for purpose? 
how can we look at its funding? Uh, but for the time being, I would say, let's work with what we have because we're probably at the beginning of some challenges to come. So uh, for the time being, let's work with uh, the agency. Let's not try to undermine uh, the important work that they're doing. No, I agree with that. Um, let me change the subject. Uh, still connected, but change of subject. A question um, from uh, Ali Rougeau, and it's about climate change. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are all rightly and inevitably seized with the immediate issue that's in front of us. And how could we not be? That's perfectly understandable. But similarly, ticking like a clock in behind us is the inevitable pressure of climate change and the pressure to make substantial improvement over the next say 10 years before we get to a potentially a really serious tipping point um, with respect to the climate crisis. How do you see as we hopefully, and I think we will, um, exit from the current crisis, it will nonetheless have substantial economic consequences. Um, we will look at, uh, I think across many countries, unprecedented levels of unemployment, there will be substantial damage to businesses because we have never shut down our economy the way the, the, our, our economies have been shut down now. That opening process is going to be challenging. Repairing businesses, repairing economies is going to be very challenging. So with that playing in the background, how do we also continue to have some focus on what is undeniably a fundamental and existential question, which is climate change, and how do we get refocused on that? Well, one thing that came out uh, or is coming out of the crisis is this, uh, I think, uh, even a better understanding that global crises uh, require global uh, response. Uh, this is a global challenge. Like I said, maybe the world was living in this sense. You know, if you look at the world history, we had 75 years of, 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 of uh, you know, a lot of stability, predictability. There was nothing on a global scale. I mean, even September 11, you could say that uh, this was dramatic. A life was lost. Um, terrorism became on, on, on the lips of everyone. Uh, health and safety of people became a concern. But sometimes I say, you know, it, it was still in New York and the world was looking in the United States. But uh, over the last 75 years, we've never had anything which was global in its scope like we're seeing today. Like you could be a student at the Hmong school and you are as much as risk as, as a health worker where I am here or whether you'd be in India or uh, anywhere else in the world. So I think my, and it, it might not be the best word, but there's a sense of togetherness that you could not say, well, I'm sitting here where I am now. I'm in the, uh, you know, a rural part of Canada and say, well, that does not affect me really. It is what I see on the TV. I think that there's a sense that, wow, for the first time, what you see on TV can be next door or at your front door uh, when you go to the grocery store and people have come back to the basics. At the same time, I think it's making people reflect and thinking that these global challenges, you know, somehow the pandemic, you know, the virus is invisible. Um, it knows no border. If you look at global uh, climate change, it's also invisible, it knows no border. So I think there will be a sense, a renewed sense, I would hope, of building better, of building greener. I think like you said, Michael, and, and you're an expert on the economy, uh, when you put the economy on pause, this has never been tried before. Uh, it's never been taught, I would think, even before. I mean, we're writing a book that has never been written. Um, it's like when you were asking me the repatriation, we're trying to document what we did because there was no manual for that. Uh, no one had said one day you would be facing uh, a world in lockdown, an economy on pause, airline would stop flying. They never had that. A border would be closed, airspace would be closed, that, that a foreign minister would have to negotiate a lending right for Air Canada to land in Germany. I mean, you would have asked me that in December, people would have said, what are you talking about? Uh, so now as we are, you know, rethinking about supply chain, domestic production, um, you ask very, very relevant question about, um, you know, the world order after post COVID. I think, and I hope that not only with respect to the pandemic, 
uh, but we will realize that maybe the last 75 years have given us uh, perhaps a false sense of comfort uh, that these things don't really touch us. And now, bang, in our face, within a matter of weeks, um, it became something that wherever you live in the world, uh, whether you're a student or you're a retiree, uh, wherever you might live, uh, you're faced with a challenge where your personal response will have an impact on your family, your community, and ultimately uh, the country. So uh, I, I would think that the sense of awareness, hopefully, if there's something, if there's only one thing out of this crisis that I hope people will remember, is this sense that uh, when, when government and and institutions and academia and students are taking to the streets um, and to, to warn us about an impending uh, challenge that is coming, that people will listen. Um, and, and I think we had an example with this pandemic now, which is invisible, knows no border, and everyone is at risk. Uh, climate change is kind of the same. And we just need to, I think it hopefully will be easier to make the case and I have a lot of trust in the leaders that go to Monk School to make sure that we build a better world, uh, a, a more prepared world, uh, a more aware world of where we are today. Francois Philippe, this point you just made is really, just so I can editorialize for two seconds, is really important. Um, you know, in the midst of a crisis of this magnitude, sometimes it's hard to think about the positive things that can be done in the wake of a difficult situation like this. And I think your answer about you know, mobilizing that idea that, you know, we're all in this together, that there's only one planet, um, and pivoting on that to address climate change is one. Another one is I think there is a unique opportunity in front of all of us um, to reposition our economies, to invest more, yes, on climate change, but to do some of the things that need to be done to secure Canada's economic future. All of it under the rubric, you know, as you've just talked about in a way of never wasting a, gr a good crisis, as Ram Emanuel once said. And we do have, you know, an opportunity now to think positively about the positive things we can do to, yes, make a better world, to make a stronger economy for Canada going forward. So there's also, you know, in the midst of this, of these challenges and some of this darkness, there's also positive opportunities to do positive things uh, to make the world a better place for, for, for the future. But I'll stop editorializing. Gonna ask you two other things before we, before we time out. Um, very relevant question um, that's been raised um, by Notion Mezabin Chowdhury, who's one of our incoming students. Very relevant question. Um, she's an international student um, wanting to come to, uh, to the University of Toronto, to the Monk School in the fall. Um, and obviously, we're very keen that she's able to come uh, to join us at the school in the fall. So her question, which I know is on the minds of a lot of um, incoming students, um, how are you thinking about, how's the government thinking about this issue about travel restrictions, visa issues uh, for international students who want to um, attend Canadian universities this fall? Well, first of all, I would say, uh, lucky you, you know, I, I wish I could go back as well and go to the Monk School, but you never know, you know. Uh, Just apply, Francois Philippe. I, I, you know, it's, she, you, you got admitted, so it's great. <laughs> Congratulations. And, uh, and, and I would say you enrich the curriculum and you enrich the faculty. I've had the chance to study abroad and to live abroad. Totally and I, agree. Um, I would say if I had only one piece of advice, uh, Michael, is to students, I would say never take, always take the road less traveled uh, because you never know where it's going to bring you. But the wealth of experience and, and the world now being what it is, I think Canada uh, can be a beacon of hope to the world and what you're going to learn there is going to serve. Uh, for international students, I mean, there's two things that come to mind. Uh, first of all, uh, it's still very much uh, work in progress uh, because uh, we, we, universities, provinces still have to decide how um, the economy is going to be, how, how we're going to deconfine in a way and, and what is the right approach. And we are obviously in consultation with a number of universities and provinces to decide how can we reopen our border and uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, we take care of the health and safety of everyone. Uh, the other thing that uh, I know uh, my colleague, Minister Mendicino, and this is something we have been looking at, is 
trying to have a sense of flexibility about extending permits that might not already be issued or to be issued because we realize even for Canada that uh, Canadian travelers uh, by no fault of their own could be stranded in a country and they could technically uh, uh, you know, extend the visa they've been granted because they can just come back. So we had to talk to other governments to say, how can we deal with that? And I know Minister Mendicino have been seized of that question um, because the international students, I've said even before the pandemic, Michael, uh, students were voting with their feet. Uh, when I was international trade minister, as there's no federal minister of education, the international education piece come under uh, the minister of international trade. And I've always been a big proponent. You know, when I was thinking that Canada can make a difference in terms of health diplomacy, food diplomacy, I think education diplomacy, um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. peace, order, good government. Uh, this is the foundation of our country. And when I traveled around the world before the pandemic, it resonated and the way we are teaching and the way we are trying to enrich the curriculum and the way that we're trying to position Canada. Uh, you know, when you have a crisis, you have to be humble. We don't get everything perfect. We don't pretend that we can ever do everything perfectly, but at least we acted and we did. We put people, people, people at the center of every decision we did. Because in, in a time of crisis like that, what I think is expected and needed from leaders, uh, the best antidote to fear is hope. And hope grounded in reality and hope grounded in facts and hope grounded in action. And hopefully we have been able to live uh, to that high standard that will give uh, confidence to students to come to Canada, uh, confidence that they can uh, uh, help us shape uh, Canada's better future and, and that they would enrich the discussion. The uh, liberal democracies need vibrant institutions like the Hmong School uh, to make sure that you hold us to account, um, you help us shape the future. And there's never been a better time, like you said, Michael, when you put the world on pause, before you put on play or fast forward, that's all we're just gonna be on play. Uh, we, we can start thinking, what can we do differently than we did before? And, and I think it's a unique opportunity where you faculty and students can provide us great input. Um, last thing, cause I know we're, uh, the clock is ticking. Last, uh, I think it's a great question to, uh, to finish with. Uh, question from, uh, another of our students, uh, Carlo Moya, uh, who said earlier this year, Kevin Rudd, uh, the former prime minister of Australia was at the school. Um, this is before I arrived, but as I understand it, delivered quite a remarkable speech about uh, the importance of politics um, and the importance of politics in the world. Carlo's question is, what advice, you're in public life, you're an important, you have a very senior position uh, in the government of Canada, you're all over the world. What advice uh, for the students participating this morning would you have for those who want to pursue a career in, in public life, in the public sector? Uh, what are the kinds of things they should be thinking about and what have you learned in your life that you'd want to pass on to them? Well, that's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, the first thing I would say, be true to your values and principles. You know, in times of crisis, you need to be grounded and, and you have to be grounded in values and principles, uh, the ones that you believe in strongly. The second thing I did alluded that is take the road less travel. Um, this is not a time to go back to conventional wisdom. This is the time to find new wisdom in how the world can be. Don't be constrained by the world that you see today. I often say what is challenging for leaders and decision makers is to be constrained by the world that you see today. And I'll give you an analogy. Um, I live next to a river that where I live, uh, they were logging. So they were putting a lot of logs in the river. So all my childhood, I was looking at that river and we could um, never go on boat on the river because actually you could almost walk on all the logs to cross the river. So the reality that I was brought into was that there will never be a boat on that river because it was inconceivable at the time. Today, this is probably one of the most traveled river uh, you have in Quebec, which goes for 400 kilometers. So it's full of boats. So in, in less than 20 years, this thing has become something. So I would say, don't be constrained by what you see. Don't be constrained by conventional wisdom. Think exponentially. Don't think linear. 
the world that you're going to you see, especially after what we have gone through, think exponentially. Don't just extrapolate what you assume today and think this is necessarily the future. And never underestimate the power of one. Um, in, in times of crisis like that, you look around and Michael said it, you may rely on um, institutions that exist. You may rely on all ways of leadership. You may rely on control and command structure. You know what? Uh, in times of crisis, never underestimate the power of one. You and, and many others have the power to seize the moment, to call the world to action, to change the norm, to build better. And, and I would say the world that we are going to be entering, I think people will ask for more openness, more transparency, more accountability. And, and today, with uh, you know, look at what we're doing today, Michael. We still have 318 people with us in a virtual way. Um, sometime I look back and, and there was no manual for what we've achieved, uh, but you have to believe in yourself and, and know that you will do mistakes along the way. But if you remain true to your beliefs and um, the last thing I would say, Michael, is that uh, there's never been a better time to broaden uh, your, your horizons. Um, I've learned that from a, a old Sherpa at the time, uh, which was telling me that uh, leaders that he had met in the world uh, were fit. So it impressed me, but he said, take care of the asset because that's the only one you have, which is yourself. He said, take care of that. The second thing is that life is, uh, learning is a lifelong journey. Uh, I know that when you finish at the monk school, you'll be best prepared, but just look at what we are facing today. How many leaders do you think at any knowledge or education or expertise in pandemic before? Uh, people had to learn very quickly. I don't think there's many people who would have known what is a COVID and what kind of viruses and how they can be transmitted. And the last thing, and Michael alluded that uh, at the beginning, the power of people. Um, I think that we have been able to achieve a number of things and I've been able in my current role uh, because I had this pretty wide network of people who very unexpectedly came to help at the moment of crisis. So um, at the same time that you do all that, just make sure that the friends you're making today, the people you're making today can enrich uh, your thought making uh, process uh, during uh, your life as a leader. So with that, Michael, I'll turn over back to you. Okay, well, Francois Philippe, uh, I want to, um, I really want to thank you. Um, in my mind, just to take your phrase, you, uh, you exemplify the power of one. And you exemplify the power of one because of something else you say. Because you have a set of values that you're rooted in, and those values are Canadian values. And that makes you, I think, in my opinion, I want a great representative for our country uh, around the world. Yes, in the current crisis, but also for the future. So um, you exemplify what public life is about. So uh, thank you. Uh, this has been a real pleasure for me, and I think an honor for us at the school to have uh, you've been generous with your time. Thank you again, and I wish you uh, all good things and the best of luck as you take on the challenges that are ahead. But many, many thanks, Francois Philippe. Well, thank you. It's been a great honor. Thank you to all the students and I hope we can do that again. And after that, I'm going to be trying, we're doing the dry run of a virtual parliament. So talking about liberal democracies and accountability. So after this video, the next one is going to be to try to see how we can have a virtual parliament. So with that, Michael, I would say, hope we can do that more often. Thank you to the students. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for faculty and, and for being who you are and true to the Canadian values. So with that, uh, I'll say au revoir à la prochaine. It's been au revoir à la prochaine. Merci, Merci bien et bonne journée.